Welcome to the Weird and Wicked podcast. I'm Kristen. And I'm Rachel. And we're two sisters with a passion for the mysterious and the unknown. On our podcast, we will explore killer cases and the most puzzling phenomena. Come with us down the rabbit hole where we will take a magnifying glass to the most bizarre, unnerving, and unbelievable stories. From true crime and conspiracy theories to ghosts and cryptids, we'll cover it all. Today, we'll be talking about the Order of the Solar Temple. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Either way, get ready for a wild ride. That's right. If you woke up today and thought to yourself, I really need to listen to a fresh podcast with a crazy story, you've come to the right place. Let's dive in. Warning, this episode contains topics such as graphic murder, suicide, and occult themes. It is strictly intended for mature audiences only. Be advised that the following content may be triggering to some listeners who are sensitive to such topics. We can all prevent suicide. If you or someone you know is experiencing suicidal thoughts or a crisis, please call the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 immediately. This story is recounted from a number of sources that are listed in the show notes. Our discussion on this podcast is based solely on our own research and conclusions. Listener discretion is advised. Here we go. Here we go. I don't even know what episode we're on, right? Oh, God. I lost count already. I love (laughs) it. uh, Five, I want to say. Five or six, maybe? Six. I think it's six. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter really because they might be going out of order anyway. I know. Yeah. Well, we have a good one today for you guys. Oh, so yes. So let's, let's get right let's into get it. Let's get into it. Morin Heights is a popular skiing destination in the mountains of Quebec, Canada. On October 4th, 1994, residents and tourists were readying their equipment and preparing to hit the slopes as ski season was soon beginning. At the same time, Firefighters were responding to a call at a local ski chalet. A fire had broken out that at the time was thought to be an accident. But as they searched the charred building, they found a chilling discovery that would prove to be only the beginning of of a string of mass murder suicides across the globe, all connected to the new religious movement called the Order of the Solar Temple. It all started in 1984 with two men by the name of Joseph DeMombro and Luke Jure. I hope I said those names right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, w- I kept calling it Jorette, but... Yeah, um, Jorette. Uh, he's got to be I'm French, sure. it sounds like. It sounds Jure French, sounds yeah. better. Who knows? Now, Joseph was born in rural southern France in 1924 and had an interesting beginning. Instead of going to college, Joseph spent his time in the clockmaking and jewelry business. He was employed in his field, or he was employed in this field ever since he was a young man. Besides this seemingly normal occupation, Joseph was also very interested in occultism. And by the age of 32, he joined and was an avid member of the ancient and mystical order of the Rose Crucis. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, yeah, do they call so it? A lot of, I what? think I think it's Crucius. Crucius. Disclaimer: There's going to be a couple, probably a, a, quite a bit of different names and stuff in this episode that are a little bit hard to pronounce. So yeah. just cut us some slack. Bear um, with us. Yeah, but yeah, that's a, a very interesting name: Ancient and Mystical Order of the Rose mm-hmm. Crucius. I it's a like mouthful. It. Yeah, so it like, sounds <laughs> very fancy, and it sounds like they're selling rosé. <laughs> if, if that's the case, I'm on board. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. This was an American Rosicrucian group that gained a lot of popularity and was quite successful after World War II. He was so active in the group that he eventually became the head of a lodge in France in the 1960s and remained a significant figure in the group until 1969. This is when he decided that he wanted to branch out of his career to become a New Age movement lecturer and speaker. 
Between 1970 and 1980, Joseph found the center for the preparation of the New Age in France and later established the communal group La Pyramide in Switzerland. The latter was superseded by the Golden Way Foundation two years after it was established. Okay. Why do cults always have the weirdest names? Yeah, what's up with these names? Or not even just cults, like these smaller religious groups, they always Mm -hmm. have like the most elaborate names. Absolutely. Like Center Center for the Preparation of the New Age. (laughs) It sounds so serious. Yeah, right. But why? (laughs) Why? I don't don't get it. Oh, man. It was in Geneva, Switzerland that Joseph really blossomed in his career as a New Age teacher. Often, He often claimed to be the incarnation of Moses, the Egyptian pharaoh, Akhenaten, and other ancient figures. It wasn't until the early 1980s that Joseph would get to know another man with similar beliefs by the name of Luke Jorette. Again, with the cults. I mean, like... Why are we claiming that we're the incarnation of these people who lived thousands of years before us? Like, what? Yeah. I mean, I guess if people are that gullible, maybe they'll listen to you. But Yeah. I mean, I don't get it. It happens, like, across the board, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, With all these people claiming that they're, like, the incarnation of Jesus Christ or... You know, all these crazy, yeah. crazy accusations. There, there's always that guy on the side of the road in your city that everybody calls the Jesus man or the Jesus <laughs> yeah. guy. Like, I feel Absolutely. like every single town has that guy. For sure. And it's, it's always him that's like, I am Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. So Luke was born in 1947 in the Belgian Congo, Africa. In the 50s, his parents relocated to their homeland, where Luke received a medical degree at the Free University of Brussels. During his time in college, he involved himself in a lot of questionable groups, one of which, called the Walloon Communist Youth, put him under police surveillance. After graduating in 1974 with his medical degree, Luke joined the Belgian army as a paratrooper. His lifestyle drastically changed after his time in the army was over, though. Luke started to study homopathy and became a practitioner in France. He traveled all over the world and studied many different alternative and spiritual healing practices. As he studied, he also would give lectures about holistic health. I said that right, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Holistic health, yeah. Holistic, yeah. People who believed in him could be recruited to join his club, which was named the Amenta Club. It was in his travels that Luke had been requested by Joseph de Mombro to give a lecture at the Golden Way Foundation in Geneva, Switzerland. So this guy, <laughs> he's born in Belgian Congo, has seemingly, like, as far as we know, had a regular upbringing, just got into some questionable shit, like joined a communist youth group as um, one does <laughs> yeah as one does in the uh in the 50s <laughs> <laughs> yeah um police already were looking at this guy he, mm-hmm. he had just graduated and got his medical degree and they were already looking at him yeah um but just I feel like ever since he graduated, he got his medical degree, and then all of a sudden he's getting into this weird stuff, and already he's, like, recruiting people to join his club. Yeah. <laughs> like, the Amenta Club. Like, oh, it sounds so exclusive. Right. <laughs> exactly. Just weird vibes. Definitely weird vibes. hmm Yeah. The two bonded over the course of Luke's time in Geneva. They came to find that they had extremely similar belief systems and experiences. Joseph had been a Ro- Rosicrucian, and Luke had been affiliated with the Renewed Order of the Temple. They quickly became friends after exploring their shared interests and common goals. And they decided to form their own religious group, which they named the Order of the Solar Temple. So basically, they were like, 
you have questionable beliefs. I have questionable beliefs. Let's mm-hmm. start our let's, own club for people who have questionable that. beliefs. <laughs> like, yes. You can oh, see the, the beginnings mm-hmm. of this interesting group start. That's yeah. Very clear. Mm-hmm. Although they were both avid speakers, they strategized by dividing their roles within the group. Luke would travel and give lectures that were meant to recruit followers. Joseph considered Luke to be a charismatic and knowledgeable guy, which made him the perfect person to be the face of their order. On the other hand, Joseph appointed himself to be the one who would run the show from behind the scenes. So basically it sounded like they had a pretty good deal that they Mm -hmm. worked out. Like, you be the face of it, you do all the talking, I'll handle all the money in the background. Yeah, I'll manage you know, I'll make, it. I'll make the plans. I'll be this, like, basically, like, the head of it without being the head of it, like, out in public, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it um, is interesting that they teamed up because in a lot of these, like, religious groups or cults, you don't see two people. It's always, like, one person who wants to be in control and, like, be the main guy. That's so true. I can see how they needed like a face as one guy, but they were mm-hmm. definitely like both calling the shots and like both being really being right. leaders together. It's yeah. just interesting. So the base of their belief systems was basically a marriage between the Templars tradition to the New Age, a modern branch of the Knights Templar. They combined these two and added a little bit of UFO religion sprinkled in. Just like, a little bit of UFO <laughs> spice, you yeah, know? You exactly. can't go without that. <laughs> I don't know. I Personally, I like my cult sweet. I'm more of a sweet cult kind of girl. Oh, yes. I don't know about I'm you. with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so random. Like, um, the Knights Templar had nothing to do, obviously, with UFOs and stuff. But yeah. they're just like, why not? Let's mm-hmm. do it. <laughs> And we'll explain exactly what we mean later on. Um, what what we what we mean by a little bit of UFO religion sprinkled in because yeah. they weren't totally about like oh UFO UFOs are real. It was more like they linked their beliefs into mm-hmm. um, that that side of the spectrum. It's yeah. really hard to explain. We'll get into it later. Yeah, we'll get into it. So going back in history, the Knights Templar was one of the most wealthy and favored Catholic military orders during the Crusades. Founded in 1119, the Templar was originally endorsed by the Roman Catholic Church. The militia wore distinctive white robes with a a red cross on their chest. After existing for nearly two centuries and with the turn of the Crusades, the Templar became less important, and therefore the support of the military slowly dissipated. They also drew inspiration from other New Age religions and leaders, such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and Aliester Crowley. Uh, Ali, El, is that how you say that? I think you <laughs> oh, said it right, yeah. Aliester. Aliester. <laughs> Something yeah, like that. I, yeah. Who was the head of the Ordo Templi Orientis. Both Love religions, <laughs> I know, again with these names. <laughs> Both religions were similar to that of the Solar Temple. Within the order, a, sh- a short of hierarchy, <laughs> a sort of hierarchy was created. On- so, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. So basically, I just want to do a quick rundown. So basically, yeah. the Knights Templar was this old um, military group. Mm -hmm. back during the crusades and this is what they drew inspiration from for their belief systems Um, which is weird like did i mean i didn't really read too much into the knights templar but i feel like really the only inspiration they took was wearing that outfit like the white yeah it's like the the same robes because it's like a roman catholic church group i mean it they fought for the Roman Catholic Church, I guess you could say. So mm-hmm. the beliefs that they pulled from it, I don't see, but yeah. <laughs> maybe we just missed that in the research. But it's very yeah. interesting. If any of you guys have, have any information about that, just let us know. So back to the structure of their group. On the lowest structure or the first structure, they had the Amanta Club. 
This was a group that would give lectures about their teachings, and they often drew large numbers of people to listen. Few of these people were recruited to join the club, though. After individuals in the Amanta Club proved themselves knowledgeable of their teachings and fit for a higher status, they were invited to join the second structure, called the Arcadia Club. Ar Archadia Club? <laughs> I think it's Arcadia. Arcadia Club. I think. These members were provided with more advanced knowledge that would give them the opportunity to reach an even higher level of consciousness. Only the elite from the Arcadia Club were invited to join the third structure called the International Knighthood Organization. This was extremely restricted, but members in this tier had access to special documents and also to future initiations to the structure itself. So, right. So there were three three different levels. Tiers, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first one being the Amanda Club, which was basically for like first time goers, just getting just new to this thing. But you were still selected to be in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you couldn't just be you couldn't just like be a member of this. Oh, yeah. Like you still had to be somewhat knowledgeable of the same belief systems that the two leaders Luke and Joseph had um it's just funny to me that it was like so exclusive they made it they, they really made it did. sound like it was like a club for elites or some something like that mm -hmm. and I think in some of the sources that even said that it it was meant to appeal to people who had a lot of money or celebrities i guess mm -hmm. you could say at that time or just really famous people yeah i believe they wanted people with deep pockets because there i read mm -hmm. that there were those like initiation fees and oh yeah later on we'll also get into more um evidence that these people were pretty wealthy in these groups right. So in 1989 there were 442 people who were members of the solar temple to members in the order, Joseph was a representative of higher beings. He was the head honcho. At its peak, the order had many different lodges in Canada, Australia, Switzerland, Martinique, and other countries. These lodges had altars, rituals, and costumes, which members of the lodge participated in. Whenever an initiation ritual was held, the initiates were expected to make expensive purchases including jewelry, regalia, and initiation fees. During these rituals, members were required to wear official robes of the order and sometimes hold a special sword, which Joseph claimed was a Templar artifact given to him a thousand years ago in a past life. Maybe that's where the Knights Templar comes in. He's just like, yeah, I got this sword from the Templar. Yeah. And yeah. It's badass. <laughs> it was just <laughs> proof. Yeah, it was exactly. proof. It was proof, yep. It was also during the group's peak that Joseph fathered a child. He named her Emmanuel and saw her as the future leader and guide of the New Age. According to Joseph, she was the cosmic child. In order to assist Emmanuel in her task in bringing in the new age, Joseph chose mates for some of the followers in hopes that they would have special children who could help her. This is just beyond weird. Yes. <laughs> like, it's already going downhill. He's mm -hmm. controlling who can be with who so that his daughter has, like, special helpers. Yeah, adequate people that will help her. <laughs> like... It, uh, it's just so much of that is weird to me. I love how they can just like dub these people like this is the cosmic child. Yeah. She will like save all of our souls or whatever oh, the hell and it they just it also just so happens to be Joseph's child, not oh, like yeah. anyone else's just child. So <laughs> exactly. Of course. God, what are the chances? Oh my god. <laughs> even though we haven't mentioned this yet, but even though he already had a son by this point. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I do. Who apparently here. wasn't as significant for reasons we'll go over later. Yeah. I mean, apparently he wasn't the cosmic child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Emmanuel is the cosmic child. <laughs> Interesting because he was the firstborn son. Mm -hmm. Um you think I guess maybe 
modern day enough, but you'd think that he would be the special one. Yeah. So at this point, you might be asking, did anyone ever question Joseph or Luke? Doesn't this all sound a bit crazy? Yes, it does. Of course it does. (laughs) Some of the followers would question Joseph's authority and supposed mystical powers. One member who left the group in 1991 filed a lawsuit against it, claiming that it was a cult, which, yeah, clearly is a cult. He got it right. Yeah. (laughs) Now, Joseph also happened to have a son named Illy, who was also skeptical about his father's teachings. He later found out that the spiritual visions and messages that Joseph claimed to have were staged by special effects and holograms. (laughs) I love it. He just doubted himself. He knew he had to stage this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really sad. Yeah. (laughs) Because his own son (laughs) called him out. Yeah. So, yeah, Illy shared his findings with the group, and this caused around 15 or so members to depart from the order. Um, rightfully just... so. <laughs> so you I just like, can't believe, believe that. Dude. I can't believe <laughs> All that of a he... sudden you hear it from his son that he's right. a total yeah. fake. <laughs> exactly. And I, I honestly can't believe that he thought he could just get away with that. Like, I, right? I really wonder, how, like, what he was, what kind of special effects he was using to stage this. Like, well, we'll get into that later. I remember, <laughs> I remember one dude. I'll, we'll talk about it later. I yeah. won't give any mm-hmm. details away. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But yeah, yeah, it's really weird. Um, what year was this in the '90s too? So he had to have some money to get his hands on these like holograms and. <laughs> Yeah, special well, clearly he was getting some from the members. From so. the members, yeah. Probably not just some, it was probably a lot. Yeah. More and more people grew skeptical of Joseph. Over the course of just two years, membership continued to drop, and with it went financials. Revenue dropped from over 483000 in 1991 to just 89000 in 1993. Oh my god. That's a big draw. A lot of money in just two years. Oh my gosh. Then in 1993, Luke attempted to purchase illegal firearms and silencers. Great. The publicity. I know. It's like, oh my God. I I have no words. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. The publicity from his arrest destroyed his own reputation, of course, Mm -hmm. and put the group on authorities' radar. At the same time, Joseph's health was in decline. He developed cancer and had kidney troubles, which led to incontinence. His health decline is believed to be what caused a significant change in his plan for the coming of the new age and his own attitude, of course. Mm -hmm. On February 28th, 1993, the tragic event at the Branch Davidians compound in Waco, Texas was reported. Um, So if you're not familiar with this event, you should definitely Google it. It's one of the most mind-boggling, heartbreaking, Mm -hmm. yet, like, captivating and interesting stories about a cult. Yeah. It's probably one of the more popular stories um, Mm -hmm. because the news coverage of it was just insane. Yeah. Um, It was really sad. Yeah. But definitely go – I think there's a documentary – not a documentary, it on Netflix? but it's, it's like a show that's based on the events on mm-hmm. um, on Netflix. I think it's called Waco. Yeah, I think you're right. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Upon seeing the tragedy televised, Joseph felt that it stole the show from him. He told his most trusted partner, Luke, quote, In my opinion, we should have gone six months before them. What we will do will be even more spectacular. End quote. Which... That just says it all right there. Yeah. Like, that just proves that they were planning this for exactly. forever. Mm-hmm. Joseph and Luke agreed that it was time to take action. It was almost as if making the news or making headlines was the only way they could carry out their ultimate goals. Together, they took some time to plan their next move, which would come in the in the form of one of their teachings. Now, let's back up a bit. So one of the main teachings in this group was that of transits. Mm 
Mm-hmm. According to the Solar Temple, the specific goal of a transit is to begin the new world. At first, Joseph described to his followers that the transit is sort of a passing through a mirror or traveling in a spaceship. He believed that this is how they were meant to return to the Father. Interesting. Uh, a mirror I know. and a spaceship. Okay. And there's that's where the UFO religion uh, comes in comes because in. of this spaceship theory. Um, he didn't think it was going to be a physical spaceship, but he he related it to it and used that as like um, an explanation to try to get all of his followers on board. Like we have to go to the better world, this better world. He was probably telling them that this place is terrible. Like we have to get out mm-hmm. of here so we can reach a higher conscience. Mm-hmm. Um, and conscience, right? Con, no, not conscious. Con- consciousness. Consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And get to the better place where we can live in harmony. What did they think that was was gonna happen? They're just gonna like die, and then they're just they're just transported into a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> taken yeah or know. if it's just a mental spaceship that takes you. i don't know what his goal was with very with interesting that. over time however the word transit seemed to evolve and soon it took on a much deeper somewhat darker meaning among some of the followers to them transit became understood as a change in consciousness like kristen mentioned and of course with the change in consciousness came preparation for the change itself. Joseph would tell followers that in time, they would be called to a meeting in which they would partake in their transit, their change in consciousness and return to the father. He told them to be on alert all hours of the day in case they received their call. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning of the end. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, sad because you can see that by telling all of the followers like be on alert like get like be ready for the call and be ready to go and when you get the call Mm -hmm. um you can just see that he's preparing to basically take everybody out with him and just Mm -hmm. mentally preparing them to trying to convince them you know whenever he's ready or whenever they're ready Mm -hmm. yeah and these people believed him Mm -hmm. which is sad so letters were written to several public figures explaining that the order of the solar temple would be making their change in consciousness soon they described their preparations for their departure of this earthly plane in the meantime joseph began destroying any documentation of his group in order to keep the mystery around the around the departure so it was almost like he was making an attempt to like put that put his group on the map kind of mm-hmm. like getting attention from media and like political leaders and stuff for um, sure and then at the same time destroying any like documentation he has so nobody could figure out if he was serious or not <laughs> so yeah. it'd be even even more dramatic uh but So, on October 3rd, 1994, 300 envelopes were mailed by a member on behalf of Joseph. These contained some of the Order of the Solar Temple's texts, a copy of a letter addressed to the French Minister of the Interior, and a videotape. The envelopes were mailed to many different locations around the world. In the letter addressed to the French Minister, Joseph expresses that the minister is responsible for the deaths of many of the members of his order. One of the sources describes the letter also saying that because the minister is so set on destroying all the work that the order has done, the members must, quote, leave this terrestrial plane ahead of time, end quote. This implied something much much more sinister. We tried to search everywhere online for the contents of that videotape. I tried to look on, like, I think any source I could possibly get my hands on to figure out if there was a video or something I could watch Mm -hmm. um, about what was on the tape or if anyone just explained what was on the tape, I couldn't find it anywhere. Nothing. Um, And I'm so curious what was on it because I feel like it was either instructions on how to reach this higher 
um consciousness True. like what they had to do and it was mm-hmm. probably i mean now we know it probably most likely was instructions on how to kill themselves mm-hmm. yeah i i'm so curious to see what was on that tape yeah it had to be extremely interesting so yeah. if anybody knows a source or video or documentary that explains what's on it i would mm-hmm. love to hear it <laughs> yeah anything let us know yeah. i'm just so intrigued by it me too um, cuz it's rare that you like find evidence like that cuz i'm cuz a lot i mean we'll get into it later but a lot of the evidence from this was destroyed um just in the process of everything mm-hmm. so and a lot of, it happens with a lot of other cults too but a lot yeah. of the bigger ones like like Manson and um what was the other the Georgetown one there's a lot of like Jamestown. video of Jamestown yeah i think it's called Jamestown Jamestown i think i think you're right they have like a ton of video of, yeah like exactly what, they're, what they did and their meetings and stuff like yeah, that yeah their lectures so, or whatever you yeah. want to call it and even Waco too they had all kinds of that's true. Stuff. So I wish there was more on this one just to Me see. Too. I'm really curious to see. I feel like yeah. some there it has to be somewhere. It's got to be somewhere. Unless they destroyed it. Unless it I was taken for evidence and maybe they just never released never it. Never released it. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, It's probably graphic if that's the case. Yeah, might be. So, as the downfall of the order played out, members noticed that Luke's behavior began to change dramatically. One source described him as, quote, excessively erratic and sexually obsessed, end quote. There are also reports stating that a higher member of the group was tasked with the job of installing projectors in their sanctuaries that would create illusions to trick the rest of the followers. This obviously struck Tony. This this is the guy. <laughs> well, you didn't write this so well, but Tony oh, is the guy who was tasked with this job. <laughs> yeah. So this struck this guy as super suspicious. And then he went on to like share this with their other cult members. So once hearing about this fraud, members of the group felt betrayed for having been manipulated by their leader. So this event caused a large number of followers to leave the order of the Solar Temple, which is really good timing. Mm -hmm. Um, They got out right when they needed to. Yeah. Because it also created a sense of urgency, I'm sure, though, at the same time. That's That's true. That's probably why everything wrapped up so quickly. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm glad at least the majority of the people who were originally in the group in, I think it was 1991. Um, I'm glad Mm -hmm. a lot of those people got out before any of this started to go down. After discovering that Tony had revealed these fraudulent activities with other members, Joseph and Luke became enraged at him and his family. It was then out of pure anger and frustration that Joseph ordered two trusted members to kill Tony and his family. He managed to disguise the murder by declaring that Tony's infant son, Emmanuel, was the Antichrist, and this ritual had to take place in order to bring the new age. Of course, the devoted members carried out this plan by sneaking into Tony's residence in Quebec at night and murdering Tony, his wife, and his child, Emmanuel. After autopsies were completed, it was found that Tony was stabbed 50 times, his wife, Nikki, 8 times, and Emmanuel six times, all with a wooden stake. Oh. The two members finished the job by lighting the home on fire and committing suicide themselves. It's just this this part of the story is so tragic. Like, Mm -hmm. these people had the the nerve to go into this guy's house, kill him, his wife, and his infant child. Infant child. Who, With a wooden stake. That's horrible. Who was completely innocent. Yeah, all because he, like, notified other people that this dude was tricking them. Yeah. Totally justified. But right. Clearly the group and, like, the higher members are just fucking insane. 
I can't even imagine. On the same night, Joseph and 12 of his most trusted followers came together to have a ritualistic Last Supper meal in a smaller town called Chiri. Chiri, Chiri, Chiri. Not sure how to say that either. In Switzerland. Okay. Just before. Sorry. (laughs) to interrupt you. Here we go again with another, like, idea from a different religion. So now we're copying the Last Supper. Like, Mm -hmm. what are we? Can we pinpoint it at least? It's just like. It's it's a little all over the place. Exactly. you You can see up until the very end, he was Joseph and Luke. Joseph especially was just keeping up this facade that he is such like a divine figure or something like Mm -hmm. it's just crazy just before midnight a fire broke out in a chalet where the group had been staying just a few hours later fires were reported in three different cottages in the Swiss town of Salvin when firefighters and police responded to each of the reports what they found was absolutely horrific Inside the the Shiri Chalet, 22 people were found dead, their bodies and limbs arranged so that the group would form the shape of a sun. All of the bodies were wearing ceremonial robes, and some had plastic bags over their heads. Mirrors and red curtains covered the walls surrounding them. Among the bodies were nine men, 12 women, and one young boy of age 12. So... Some sources said that it was 22, but we also found some that said it was 23 people that were found dead. Mm -hmm. So we aren't super clear on which one is correct. Yeah. Um, Just wanted to make a note of of that. Right. And one of the sources which said there were 23 bodies also mentioned that um, after investigation and everything, they found 65 bullets total in on the scene, um, including the ones that were like in, you know like used to kill people (laughs) yeah um which might make sense because a lot of the source material was saying um that a common theme among these mass murder scenes was that there were two bullets used per person so they would go on shoot each person twice that's so so interesting if there were 23 people and 65 bullets that's the perfect amount for two per person except for the last one alive who obviously would have to shoot themselves yeah um it so it's just it's absolutely chilling like mm -hmm. just to think about it it's it's horrible because a lot of these people probably didn't even know what they were getting into Mm -hmm. um i think a lot of the sources were saying that they did it pretty voluntarily but um It's just because they genuinely were led to believe that they were going to a better place and this was the Mm -hmm. way they had to do it. Yeah, it's so common in so many different cults where Mm -hmm. it's almost like they need a reason and they find this and they've got like a community and they have like other supporters and people with them. Mm -hmm. So it's really sad to see that people are like following them for the wrong reasons almost, but they get Mm -hmm. stuck. Um, because then it's so manipulative too Um, but yeah it's just really sad at the scene in salvin a total of 25 people were found dead throughout the three cottages officials stated that their cause of death was drug overdose though some of the source material says that the majority of the members took tranquilizers to die while the remaining few were shot or shot themselves Later in the investigation, it was found that the fires had been started by some sort of remote control device. So somebody was technologically inv- advanced and set up yeah. some sort of device where they could just maybe push a button and the fires would break out. So it maybe like all three mind. of the cottages um, mm-hmm. caught on fire at the same time. It's just crazy. They're like doing everything they can to I know, yeah. Kill themselves or like, you know, transit or whatever they want to call it. And it so just like, goes back to when he was telling Luke, like, we have to do something better than mm-hmm. after they saw the Waco That's um, true events. They went all it, out because of it. Yeah. hmm It just shows what a horrible scene. Mm-hmm. 
One of the members who died in the incident left a farewell note, which said that they believed they were leaving to escape the, quote, hypocrisies and oppression of this world, end quote. This just shows the teachings being, like, drilled mm-hmm. into them. and Yeah, like, they seriously were, like, brainwashed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Unfortunately for the prosecution, Joseph DiMombro and Luke Jure were two of the bodies found in the incidents. So at this point, they had no one to charge for the murders. Joseph's cosmic child was also unfortunately among the dead. Um, sad. It's sad because there are so many kids I know. who didn't choose this. But. Who were all completely innocent kids. Like mm-hmm. They had no idea. They were probably just being told by their parents, yep, we're doing this. Mm-hmm. 14 months later, on December 15th and 16th of 1995, 13 adults and three children were found dead in a clearing on a plateau in Vercors, France. After autopsies were conducted, it was found that 14 of the 16 people had ingested sedatives and were shot twice. It was apparent that the other two victims were the ones assigned the job of killing the others. They were to sedate the others, shoot them, and then use an accelerant to light their bodies on fire. After this was done, they sprayed themselves with the accelerant, lit themselves on fire, and then shot themselves in the head. I think in the source material, it was also saying that before um, the last two died, they also arranged the bodies to be, Mm. again, in the shape of a sun. Mm, Okay, that would make sense. Yeah. After this incident, remaining members of the order continued to meet. Some even wished they had been part of it. Of course, there were members who were at first horrified at the news, but the majority of them ultimately accepted the idea that it was a part of their plan to reach a higher consciousness. Some genuinely thought the members who died did the right thing. It was almost as if they were brainwashed or desensitized to it. Yeah. It's just, it's still so crazy to me reading through it again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't imagine so many people like i mean it happened like it ha- it's happened multiple times in history with many different cults but it's mm-hmm. just crazy to me that so many people can just agree to do this mm-hmm. together yeah i don't get it on march 23rd 1997 a small house in saint casimir quebec suddenly burst into flames after the fire was contained and put out five charred bodies were found in the rubble it was later determined that these five were members of the Order of the Solar Temple. Behind the house that burnt down, authorities discovered three individuals who were heavily drugged. These people were only of ages 13, 14, and 16. They were members of the group who had changed their minds about the transit and were able to escape the fire with their lives. These so, were kids. Like, yeah. No wonder why they tried to escape mm-hmm it's, it's just i i don't know how they managed to get out of it being all like drug some, drugged up yeah mm-hmm. somehow they were able to escape and i don't know i'm confused on why the others like just let them go um, the only thing i can think of is like i don't know like maybe everyone's if- heavily drugged I'm assuming like there were no plastic bags this time. There were no one shot. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming everyone was like hella drugged up and somehow they just managed to like get out. Yeah. Maybe like one like helped drag the others or something like that. Yeah. But I feel like the other people had to have been either so drugged or like unconscious to even realize Mm -hmm. something like that. Either that or maybe there was one person that felt bad. And yeah. Were, maybe it was the last person that was finishing the job and they were like, true, you guys get out of here. It's wild. I don't know. But yeah, so basically since um, Joseph and Luke both died in these transits, um, the police didn't really have anyone to charge for the murders um, because everyone that was involved in them died mm-hmm. um 
except for those three kids who obviously didn't have anything to do with it they they escaped like (laughs) um, they were just kids yeah and we read in in some of the source material that later on the cult kept going there were other members Mm -hmm. um so they were looking to see like who was leading them and there was one person um that they tried to i think they tried to charge him with yeah they tried to charge him but it just kept getting shut down i forget what they charged him with but it ended up it ended up being cleared against him yeah he was acquitted he was Mm -hmm. acquitted like twice i think because it went to trial again and yeah yeah, um, yeah he was cleared um so yeah and i think this the this cult is still going today was, oh i found it he, um this dude uh what was his name michael i'm not even gonna try to pronounce his last name oh he that's was, the guy right yeah this is the dude so he was indicted for participation in a criminal organization mm-hmm. and murder um so it went to trial and dur- like during 2001 and he was acquitted. Um, but the French prosecutors appealed at the appellate court. And that's when that was denied, I believe. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit messy. Um, that was the guy that they tried to get for the whole like For the whole That thing. was the only lead that they had. Mm-hmm. The only leader, I guess, that was left. Yeah. And that's why they tried um, to nail him to pin it on him because he was one of his name is michael to tabachnik maybe is that how you maybe that could be how you say it tabachnik that sounds right yeah um but he was one of the people who wrote some of the texts so i think that's that's why they were trying to get him because he was obviously he played a decent role in it Mm -hmm. um but it just kept getting he kept he was acquitted like every yeah. time it went to trial so yeah he was um, like not that he wasn't really an important member so mm-hmm. i kind of get it like of course we want to see justice we want to see someone locked up for this but really the only thing was the text that he created and then they based it sort of off of that so it's just crazy 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 <laughs> it's crazy <just crady. laughs> <It's crady. laughs> oh my gosh i can't speak anymore <laughs> overall Yeah, um, I was just going to say, overall, it blows my mind, the fact that these sick individuals eventually succeeded in their mission, and they never had to face justice for their Mm -hmm. crimes, and all this horrible stuff that happened. And the cult still lives on. I don't think any, like, big murder-suicide events have happened um since these ones at least not as significant but it's still around which is crazy to me it is crazy (laughs) so that i don't get i get like when a cult is alive and well it has the leader and it has that person trying to brainwash all of its followers Mm -hmm. and without that how do they keep going is it just like very small groups who continue to just like low key keep it alive. Yeah. I'm guessing it's just enough people live in a community where they can continue to practice Conti- it. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't see why they would go on. But I also I'm not a cult expert, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I wonder how long this or like any random cult would go on. Like do the kids get into it? How long could it possibly keep on going? Mm -hmm. But yeah, at least we didn't find any any other murder suicides or yeah. I didn't research any further just because I also wanted to leave this one a little bit more open ended in case there is more information that we could have missed. That way, you guys, the listeners, can fill in anywhere you'd like. Because we always want to keep conversations like this running, um, mm-hmm. especially on our social medias, uh, social media, and um, all kinds of stuff like that. 
Like we mentioned in the disclaimer, if you or someone you know is experiencing suicidal thoughts or a crisis, call the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. It's never too late to get help. To find programs, toolkits, fact sheets, and other resources to help you take effective action, you can visit the links in either the show notes or the description of this video. So with that, thank you guys for hanging out with us, and we hope you liked this episode, and we'll see you in the next one. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Weird and Wicked podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you drop a like and leave a review. And make sure to subscribe and follow us on all of our socials so you know when the next episode is up.